Hello, hello everyone and welcome to the show. I am so excited for today's episode. This is a company that does amazing work that I've been following for some time. I saw them through an ad um, on Facebook and connected with Damien here and have just, you know, loved their work. And I think it's not just uh, really incredible work that they're doing, but they have amazing results. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, and just for those of you that are, you know, coming in, the focus of today's episode will be on long format videos on social media that create insane growth and insane results. Um, so today I am go going to be speaking with Damien Dayton from Creatively. And Creatively, like I said, has some really impressive results to speak of. So they have helped over 50 companies grow. They have 10x revenue for eight plus brands and growing. They have over a billion views, that's with a B. They've created more than 250 million in revenue for their clients. And then I wanna talk about some, uh, some of the companies that they've worked with that are highlights. So we have PillowCube. That was an in-house creation that they started with. Um, and they had 10x growth year over year for th three years running. And they became the second most Googled pillow brand in the US after just three years of launching. Super impressive. Um, they also, another sort of in-house um, brand was Stair Slide with an impressive 18x ROAS. Um, then there is End Collar, uh, and they went from a revenue of 300K to 2.1 million in 30 days. And they went from 30K uh, a month to 30K days in 45 days. So again, super impressive numbers that we're looking at. And then I love Manly Brand Bands. Uh, and they went from seven to eight figures. So again, really impressive work that they're doing. They have a really cool team. Uh, maybe you've seen some of their ads. And if you've seen their ads, you have laughed out loud, just like I did when I first saw their ads. So and here we have the incredible Damien, um, who has been at Creatively for about five years, but has been in this space for closer to 20 years. Um, Damien, so tell us a little bit more about yourself. And then one of the questions, one of the things that I like to get to know from our guests is, how did you end up here on your LinkedIn you wrote? And I, I just wanted to, to quote it because I, I loved it. I am happier professionally right now than I have ever been because I get to tell funny stories that sell products that make people's lives better. Find your talent, no matter what it is, and use it to make the world better. Yes, you can use dad jokes to improve the world. So tell us a little <laughs> bit more. How did you end up here? Why, why creatively? Why creative work? Why long format? And a little bit more about your specific background. So, hush, uh, about 25 years ago, I was in college and I was going to be a doctor and save the world. <laughs> and I worked at a, a cancer institute, mm -hmm. but in my spare time, I worked on everybody's films while I was in college. Ah. And, and because I had time to do it, I was making a documentary about demolition derbies. Mm -hmm. um, at the time I was friends with Jared Hess, who ended up making Napoleon Dynamite. And, uh, and there's a bunch of other filmmakers in that group. And I would just work on some of their films mm -hmm. and on some of mine and that was something that I thought I was just doing for fun yeah. and I kind of had I had my midlife crisis really early you know <laughs> in my, I had a quarter life crisis and decided do I do I have I felt like I had some more talents and skills mm. than were just that could be used in the medical field so I decided to go into mm. film um so I've been in film tv and video mm. production for about 20 years I started making children's television on um, P for PBS, mm -hmm. a show that sign language, and we were nominated for some some Emmys for that. But in this period, I found that again and again, clients were coming to us with questions about marketing, and mm -hmm. I absolutely loved the brainstorming process. I got to work on some large commercials as, as the production company, and I just found like there are all these people throwing all these production dollars at, at mm -hmm. commercials. That weren't doing anything that that even when you ask them like well what's the objective what are we hoping this accomplishes mm -hmm. and you know about 10 years ago is when we i you know there were there were videos were still going viral but then we'd start seeing commercials doing the same thing mm -hmm. and as i was running some facebook accounts for some of my clients uh you know our, our company was and we were just posting videos there 
I had this realization that on any given day, you can create the Super Bowl effect. Mm -hmm. You know, people are spending millions mm -hmm. of dollars to be on the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And no matter what your commercial is, you pay the same rate to be on the Super Bowl. You mm -hmm. have a dumb commercial, bad commercial. You might get some earned media as people talk about it, but you all pay the same rate. Um, but on Facebook, if you have an entertaining commercial, and this is true also of YouTube and of Instagram and Meta Properties and, and TikTok and all those platforms, if you have an entertaining commercial that keeps people on that platform, mm -hmm. if they don't click away from the ad, the platform's algorithm rewards you for that by making you spend less. Mm. So we found that while everybody was going into 15, 20 second ads, if we could make a long ad that told a funny story that was entertaining mm -hmm. and it can keep people engaged, the platform liked that and it would reward us with lower costs per view. Mm -hmm. And all that we had to do is figure out, well, now how can I make them do something? Mm. Do something was mm -hmm. how to tell them about our product that's great and try to get them to buy. And, you know, we had better attribution metrics at the time, but it was really easy to create a virtuous effect. If you could just make it slightly more entertaining mm -hmm. and sell slightly better, there was a synergistic effect. Um, along the process, we kind of found as entertaining as we want to be, we can't do that work by ourselves. We need a mm. good product. Mm. And I don't know, I feel that's that's true for most people. Mm -hmm. That as they work, nobody wants to work for an evil empire. <laughs> so I try to find products that I believe in. I use I'm wearing maybe four or five of the products that we've advertised wow. right now. Um and uh we've created a formula to kind of evaluate products. So we make a niche product, which is these long form ads, but we also look for four products that fit our specific formula, mm -hmm. we call it our 5D formula. Mm -hmm. um, and then my life got really easy because it was, we filtered people based on products that we knew we could really help grow, mm -hmm. products that we loved. Because like, if we love them, if their customers love them, we just need to pull, pour fuel on the marketing fire. So the case with Andcaller, they had just started a, the, the founder was a soccer player and mm -hmm. he's like, wear my dress shirts as comfortable as my soccer jerseys. Mm -hmm. Dress shirts that were as comfortable as soccer jerseys. And then they slowly added stretchability and breathability and uh, wrinkle-free. And then mm -hmm. they finally added a hydrophobic kind of spill proof. It's like, I don't have to iron it and I can be a slob. <laughs> and I brought one into the office and I had like four people like, oh, I've got those. I love those. I'm like, nobody loves their dress shirts that way. Huh. So we reached out to them and I like to pursue companies like that as though they were Nike. And it, it was just a couple founders, some young guys mm. that were great guys. We liked a lot, but we really loved their product. Mm -hmm. So we just need to help you guys shout this from the mountaintop. Mm. Um, and so we applied kind of our formula, but we helped them tactically help them put some of the things they needed to do. But then we coupled it with some long form content mm -hmm. that could not just say, you know, we kind of went against conventional fashion advertising mm. system mm -hmm. where everybody has to look cool and serious and beautiful, but we had so many utility parts of their shirt by having fun, mm -hmm. we could be more approachable. Mm -hmm. um, was that so, before or after Chubby's? Uh, that was, that was after Chubby's because our, philosophy is chubby's obviously saw massive growth but our general philosophy for most brands although we use humor yeah we like to treat the advertising environment like a cocktail party if you will mm. nobody wants to be stuck with the accountant that's totally serious mm -hmm. but you also don't want to be stuck with a guy that's joke 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 yeah. and you know, yeah you kind of be talking to whomever it is man or woman that's a comfortable conversation mm -hmm. that you can laugh easily that they can laugh at themselves mm -hmm. most of our jokes are not making fun of the competition they're making fun mm -hmm. of us mm -hmm. as people um trying to you know probably 20 percent of my jokes are jokes that i use between my wife and i that ring true that are about real friction and in, in our relationship and life and mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah we had we had a sense of humor but we also were able to try to to sell mm -hmm. it and try different ways. And they had new products that they really wanted us to help launch. But we said, hey, you still need to launch your shirt. Even though you've yeah. had it for a year, nobody yeah. knows about it. So mm -hmm. we can launch that. And so just doing that with them, they grew really rapidly. And they, they're they still great friends. Uh, they've used other agencies for other stuff that they've done, which is totally fine. Mm -hmm. um, but we were able to help them grow. And so in our process of doing these, 
videos, we've kind of realized, hey, we've kind of have this playbook for growth. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, you can get really esoteric and really technical in the marketing world Mm -hmm. really quickly. Uh, But we've kind of boiled it down to, but what will drive growth in sales? Mm -hmm. Uh, Some performance marketers get so focused on that numbers, though, they take the creative and throw it out the window. Like, we'll throw 100 ads at us a thing and let the algorithm pick the winner. But we feel like, and this is where my background is working in a laboratory came in handy. I just Mm. said, what if we treated this like a science Mm. and ask the questions when we're throwing content? Why Mm. didn't that work or why did it work? Mm -hmm. And create scientific frameworks. I love that. You could say we don't have a formula for success, but we have a framework and it's a way to Mm. ask questions and present ideas Mm. and use some things that we've that are tried and true but the one number one rule of things that take off on the internet is they are unexpected and you're not hmm. and so we have to kind of always push that a little bit and do something a little bit new and know hmm. the type of edge that performs on the internet internet and it's not mean spirited usually and it's mm-hmm. usually mm-hmm. funny but we're not we're not punching up we're punching up and not punching down hmm. We're not uh, too insular in our comedy, but we mm-hmm. also find there's a kind of a different brand of humor for each product. And, yeah. And while we're known for our humor, we spent as much, if not more time thinking about how to demonstrate that product. Mm. Those moments, mm. our first ad for Stair Slide had a fast talking kid, had yeah. too much energy, so you feel like he's bouncing off the room, I need something to play. And that was funny, but really all I needed is to show you've got stairs, mm-hmm. I can turn them into a slide. And that's my pitch. It's mm-hmm. that simple. And I can show that a number of different ways and they're expanding mm-hmm. stairs and I can set them up different ways. Or the, excuse me, they're expanding slides and I can show them different ways. So that led us into kind of starting our first, those conversations around having this playbook for growth led us to starting our first company. We started with a Kickstarter for Pillow Cube mm-hmm. and our first Kickstarter did about 30,000, but then in crowdfunding did about 300,000. And the next year we did 30 million in revenue. And the, wow. the year after that was about, we did 3 million and then 30 million, excuse me. So that's wow. the that's the, ty- the the growth we've seen with that brand. Uh, and so they that was all being run in-house at yeah. the, in the agency. We were personally responding to comments, doing customer service. And hmm. now that is split off, we're still in the same building, but they're now yeah. company. Stair slide has now added 200 SKUs to what was just the stair slide hmm. and now Boulder play. And it is a, it's a bigger outdoor play company. Oh, that okay. Anything that that's active, collaborative and imaginative. I love uh, it. Big play. Um, so, yeah, so we have a couple in, in along the way we invested in a few companies, but we realized, I think we really want, what we want to do is either own companies or hmm. help people grow companies. Mm-hmm. And that's about, I would say about 80% mm-hmm. of our work is client-based work mm-hmm. where we can use strategies that we've really tested them out on ourselves. Yeah. We're not doing anything that we haven't done and used ourselves. Yeah. And, um, you know, there is definitely in the marketing world is you want to keep clients happy, but our job is also to tell them, Hey, mm-hmm. I know you love this idea. That's not, we have, here's the data. We don't think that will help yeah. you grow. This is where we think you should focus on. Mm-hmm. But we like to get intimately involved with the brands, which yeah. is how we met is you were commenting on one of our ads and I commented <laughs> back. Glad that you like it. So we kind of monitor those and mm-hmm. we see we don't just launch ads. We see how they're being received. Mm-hmm. And so our first, what you may not know is our first Pillow Cube ad has been seen by half a billion people. Uh, the first one that we made for the Kickstarter and we made it, it was all employees and yeah. you've probably seen some version of it before. Yeah. But what you don't know is there's 60 plus versions of that ad out mm. there that we're continually testing and reiterating mm-hmm. on on ads and trying new value prop and and moving the orders around and changing the formats mm-hmm. for different platforms. But when you create a big piece of hero content like that, you can uh, you have a lot of material to work with, so you can cut it down and add it. And we can ask why is it working? Why is it not mm-hmm. working? Or sometime more importantly, how is it working and how is it not working? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's getting great metrics one place, but mm-hmm. not something else. Mm-hmm. And so then building different pieces for different parts of the funnel. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the the whole, the backstory of how Creatively was born and the, yeah, I thought it was hilarious. The first, the, the, the commercial for Pillow Cube, it was like, 
the team. Um, I think it's it's just fascinating how you guys really started testing on yourself and then you said, hey, we found something that works and then you scaled it and found out that it, you know, you found your the right sort of companies to to really grow with and you know to help them grow. Um, so I want to move on to a couple of a number of questions that I like to ask our guests. Um, and these can you can answer them as you know as briefly as you want, or you can elaborate on them. Uh, I think it's really is interesting. One of the the things that I one of the focuses with this podcast is looking at people within companies that are doing interesting things within the world of branding and marketing. And of course, you guys are doing that. Um, and so I think that having consistency in terms of the the questions that are asked and seeing how different people are answering them will be really, really fun to, to look at. So in your opinion, what makes, what is great branding? Uh, that's the million dollar question. I think people think it's their logo and their mm. course. Mm -hmm. um, I always, I like to use the analogy of a sports team. Brands think that their brand is their cheerleaders that they've put in their colors. Mm. And I think their brand is the guys that have painted their chest in the stands. Yeah. And it's, yes. it's not like it's something in between the two. Yeah. It's what people know and feel about your brand. Yes. Um, but what branding is, I think, is very different depending on how the emotional age of your company. Mm. Um, you take a look at Google's first logo or mm -hmm. uh, Amazon or Google's first logo. We look very um, childlike and very immature. Mm. And, and what they needed at those early days in their brand, mm. you know, we look up to these companies like Apple and Nike, and we want to do branding like they're doing. Mm. It's totally inappropriate for us in mm. our early ages, much like you wouldn't feed a baby steak. Mm -hmm. you know? And a lot of our brands are like babies. Mm -hmm. And so I see a brand you has about seven years to grow up, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. In the early days of your brand, I think branding is closely tied to what your product does mm -hmm. for people in their life. Mm. You know? Features become more important, but it's really about the value that this brings to your life. Mm -hmm. uh, one shot, we work with a lot of startups and sometimes a new brand can get so esoteric in their brand, mm -hmm. and it's not at the boots on the ground, but, but how's this going to make my life better? Yeah, It's like, oh, empowered people to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. That's important, yeah. but you're selling a belt. You yeah. Know? So we need we need to remember that you're selling a belt right now. Mm -hmm. Remember that Nike started mm -hmm. selling a shoe, but specifically mm -hmm. a running shoe. Mm -hmm. And they were later focused on that mission. And now they can have a much bigger ideological. Yeah. In their brand. And they were focused I, for like 10, 15 years. Like they weren't even, they weren't even Nike before Nike. Like they were working on it for so mm -hmm. long and so pointedly that like people people forget that part of the story they were like blue ribbon i think um yeah. and they didn't become nike until like i think 13 years or something into it so there's that focus the initial focus yeah and i think it's always good to have a vision and think this is where i want to go yeah but also to not get so stuck in your formula mm -hmm. this is where because you don't know where the world's gonna go yeah so you want to have a mission and sense of purpose, mm -hmm. but also allow yourself some slack and flexibility to pivot. It's good to have that vision to say, this takes us off vision, but sometimes mm -hmm. you discover some great things along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, for Pillow Cube, we really help them decide the thing that you don't really see in much of their commercials, but is their brand statement and belief that they've got painted on the wall, which mm -hmm. is better sleep on your side. Mm-hmm. 70% of Americans identify as, as side sleepers hmm. and there aren't very many companies making products just for them. Yeah. And so we we're very mission focused. We make some things so for people that roll on their back and do all sorts of things, mm -hmm. but by taking care of that consumer first is our brand priority for pillow. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and so for me, it's, it is the brand promise. Hmm. And ironically, I feel, you know, I live in the land of Stephen Covey and the mission statements and mm -hmm, stuff mm -hmm. in Utah, but I believe that mission statements aren't very important because they get typed mm -hmm. up, beaten to death by a committee, and they live under your receptionist mm -hmm. desk. Mm -hmm. I feel that a brand is really the stories that we tell about that brand. Mm 
Hmm. The stories that we tell as a company and the stories that our consumers tell about us. Hmm. Because story is the easiest way to package a concept and an idea and a moral, mm-hmm. all of those things. So we've had a lot of success with a specific genre of performance ads that are just telling founder stories Hmm. by telling them in a unique way where you see the founder of the company as the first consumer Mm -hmm. trying to do it, not navel gazy, you know, look at how great we are, but look, this is a normal dude. This is normal. You, she saw this problem and tried to solve it. Mm -hmm. Came up with a solution that you've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of opportunities for humor, but Mm -hmm. it's easier to see people. And there's a lot of ways to represent your values and your brand in the process. Mm -hmm. People are so concerned about palette and tone that they forget about meaning. And I Mm -hmm. think at its core, Mm -hmm. when you rebrand something, you're not really rebranding it. You're just changing the color. And my favorite, you're changing the colors, but you still stand for the same things, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And so my favorite statement on branding comes from the philosopher Dolly Parton, uh, which is, the purpose of life is to figure out who you are and then do it on purpose. Mm-hmm. I think that's what branding is about. Mm-hmm. And I think brands need to be constantly asking themselves, but who are we really mm-hmm. easy to get off mission there? Mm-hmm. And to think it's about kerning and fonts, but it's about who we are and then doing that on purpose and mm-hmm. aggressively being who you are. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. So it's the, what I what I heard is the evolution of what it means to do great branding will differ based on like where the brand is um, yeah. and and really just knowing what you stand for, knowing like what's the value that you're adding to the world. Um, what what do you stand for and being very, very clear with that. Yeah. Love that. Um, so similar, but you know, you take your own um, take on on this next question. What is great advertising? Uh, I've always wanted to teach an advertising class and show like my 20 favorite ads. Yeah. Which ones they think are their favorite. Yeah. And then at the, the end, but do you remember what they were selling and do you know where to get it? Mm-hmm. So I think there's this push and pull between great branding and performance marketing. And I really think we have to work towards a, a dialectic um, that that involves both of those things. Mm-hmm. I like to think about brand formats. I think great advertising lets you know who you are and what you mm-hmm. stand for and seeing, showing how that aligns with what the consumer's needs and wants are. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, once again, I think when we talk about values, we can talk about political values or social values. Mm-hmm. And those can be important, but they can also obfuscate what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And language mm-hmm. has become coded among and social media has made this work and may may us believe we're in different tribes mm. but we're not really mm-hmm. we might have some really strong stances on certain mm-hmm. things but something like i would like my life to be a little bit easier i'd like to spend more time with my family mm-hmm. those are politically neutral things mm. to talk about mm-hmm. uh, so i actually i read more political theory books than um mm business theory books like Hmm. there's a great uh blog called strong towns great book Hmm. but it talks about you can do more good building a local park in your neighborhood Hmm. than um than lobbying congress to change laws around building parks Mm -hmm. i feel that way about advertising in that good advertising gets people to agree on something Hmm. and decide oh yeah we want more of that in our life it gets people to change behaviors Mm -hmm in the ways that they want to. Mm. That's why I don't like to, they say a great advertiser can sell a bad product, but I don't want to do yeah. that. That's mm-hmm. bad for the world. Mm-hmm. Like good advertising strips away all the BS and just lets the, that product shine for what it is and what it can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, And so I, I had an employee comes like, oh, I saw this commercial 10 years ago. I think about it all the time. Mm. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've seen that commercial. And I was like, but I can't remember for the life of me what it was for. And I think that's really important to me and a good ad yeah. is that that it's integral. What it's selling is integral mm-hmm. to the creation of the ad. And it's not just, oh, here's a funny joke. Here's a funny yeah. skit. Yeah. And it's it's a similar value to what we stand for. And so here's our, you know. Mm-hmm. 
And you, you talked a little bit about brand performance, which is something that creatively speaks about quite a bit. And you guys actually, I don't know if you coined the term, um, but you guys have this term brand formance. Uh, okay. and, and the sort of the friction between brand versus performance. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, you know, it, if you look at marketing as a sales funnel, right? not, not everybody does. Um, you can get, you can always see a higher attributable ROAS at the bottom of your funnel. Mm -hmm. And so it's easy to get addicted to that, but that mm -hmm. doesn't stop. So one of the things we learned with PillowCube, for instance, is if we're aggressive with a performance campaign that has strong elements of brand, it will drive SEO. It will drive search terms, mm -hmm. um, drive, you know, as we decided to get into retail, we had a major retailer reach out to us and say, your product is the third most searched product on our website. We don't sell your product. We have to change that. Mm. Um, and so I think for us, it's asking those questions. So at three points in our production process, we stop and we fall in love with what we're doing and what we're making, but we ask our questions, but is this going to drive, is this going to change mm. behavior? Mm. And when we're ready to show our commercial to the world, one thing we do that's unique is we do some testing with it mm -hmm. and show it to a small audience of about mm -hmm. 100,000 people and see how they behave. Mm -hmm. And we are read, willing to kill our darlings, uh, as the as the mm -hmm. Pope Park said, mm -hmm. uh, and be willing to pivot and change. Mm -hmm. So we might have a, bra a strong brand story to tell, but if it doesn't move needles, then mm. it's telling. Mm -hmm. Brands that it was, once you're in every store everywhere, like a Nike, like an Apple, mm -hmm. if I can buy it anywhere I look, then it's less important. Mm -hmm. But when nobody knows who we are, and mm -hmm. and Phil Knight and and, and Shoe Dog says, I, he hey, says, but... I don't need you have a brand and tell you you're doing a hundred million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And so we stop and ask ourselves, but is this? on set, but is this going to work? Are we showing the product in a way that makes you want it? Mm. Are we showing, are we answering the most important, instead of talking about the problem the product solves, we use the term itch and scratch all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, this scene is really itchy because mm. it makes you really want to scratch with with this product, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Kind of an off-putting term, but we like to think about it on the gut level. Yeah, I was watching, I mean, I watched all of the, all, all the, the ones that you have on your website. And I, I don't need a, like a, what is it, like the wallet? There were a bunch of things I don't need. And I was like, huh, maybe I should get a slide for, you know, for our stairs. <laughs> so you guys do that very well from this tiny data point of one person. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. But it's, it's because legitimately we like those products too. Mm -hmm. And I take the approach with every new product, like I'm visiting a foreign country and say, mm -hmm. oh, what is it that people love about this? Mm -hmm. How can I love it more? How can I love it and put that love into that commercial and show other people what we love about mm -hmm. it? If people could see your husband through your eyes, mm -hmm. they see a different man and they see that they're walking by. If you could see my wife mm -hmm. through my eyes, mm -hmm. everybody in the world would fall in love with her. And that's what mm -hmm. we're trying to do with these products mm -hmm. is see them through the eyes of somebody that loves them mm -hmm. and do for them. Yeah. I love that. Show these brands through the eyes of someone who loves them or yeah. people who love them. Love that. Um, given that you you are the chief creative officer, um, this this question, I think I, I think it'll be really interesting to see what uh, what you say. So what how do you define great design or great creative? What like what are the the the, the factors, the the makeup of great creative? How does one see it and say like, ah, that that's it? You know, I, I definitely have an eye for what I like mm -hmm. and, and, an, and a sensibility for what entertains me. Um, and I want to stay true to that. But I also like to do the cousin test and the wife test and see, like, I like to see, but how can we make this accessible mm -hmm. to enough people? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's an element of empathy there, trying mm -hmm. to understand how other people feel it. Mm -hmm. um, there's... Definitely, everybody has their own taste, and I don't haven't learned yet how to train taste in people. Hmm. But you can cultivate when you see it and encourage more of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm not a design professional, but I follow a lot of design blogs. I love good graphic designs. They mm-hmm. have books on it, but mm-hmm. you know, I barely know how to use Photoshop. <laughs> uh, I do like to draw in my spare time. Um, and so I, you know, I think that's developed. I think we all have better taste than we're able to execute. Mm. And so it's important to kind of learn about that and be okay with that process. Um, for me, it's really big w- within our company. The creative process is really what I'm over. Mm-hmm. And I think a, a lot of brands the or a lot of agencies maybe, and I can't speak, I haven't been at a lot of agencies, but I think the process is there's somebody that's kind of the gatekeeper mm-hmm. of good, and good taste. Mm-hmm. And I feel myself, I feel like my job is not the gatekeeper of that. Mm-hmm but to get, to keep the whole, to hold the torch up to a creative process mm. where ideas can full, flow freely and people can identify a good idea in somebody else mm-hmm. and then they can add something to that. Mm-hmm. And it's really important within our structure is that we have great writers, but that our directors add something to it and the wardrobe people add something to it. And the editors, when they get add something and each person has their great taste. Mm-hmm. And so I think part of that is, um, you know, there is a whole school of aesthetic philosophy um, and some aesthetics are durable and remain great for a long time, but some are very immediate. You're like, mm-hmm. but I love that. And mm-hmm. um, one of our tenets is we would rather choose something. If we have a room of 10 people and show it to them, we'd rather pick something that really moves four people mm. of it. Mm-hmm than something that everybody's okay with Mm, mm, mm -hmm. and something that three people love will often be hated by three people but that is still more powerful than than something that everybody's okay with Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we do look for what i call spikes or lightning strikes Mm. we're like oh no i just saw a reaction in the room and we do a lot of collaboration and brainstorming Mm -hmm. together when you strike on something that strikes a nerve with people yeah i I really look for that love reaction that people are like, ooh, I love mm. that. Ooh, that's really mm-hmm. lovely. That's really nice. Mm. Um, and I I care about getting a strong reaction um, mm. more than every, because something that's every, everybody's okay with becomes very skippable. Yeah. Or I've seen that yeah. before. And yeah. I've certainly gotten by with some stuff that's not explosively great, but that for me, I de- great design, great creative inspires big reactions. Mm-hmm. This may be a shorter answer. I love so that, I yeah. little, there there were some ads that I watched that I was like, ooh, you guys are making like a, a little provocative, like with the clean cult, I think, watching yeah. it. It was like, okay, you guys went there, cool. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I think I think it's great. You mentioned basically the, you know, there's the four people with a strong reaction versus the 10 that are just feeling okay about it. And you guys talk about skip, skip, not creating skip, skippable ads. Talk more about that. What what is a skippable ad, and why should you not have that? You also call them like interruption ads, and yeah. Well, I say so. We actually believe one hundred percent in skip. The format is a skippable ad, but we try. It, and let me explain that. There's different ad sets. I can make you watch my ad, mm-hmm. or I can present it and give you this skip button and if you're not interested you can skip it Mm -hmm. that skippable ad is a much cheaper format to put in front of people Mm -hmm. and they like it because they were Mm -hmm. watching something on youtube or they were scrolling through something Mm -hmm. but with that skippable ad so we get with that skippable ad because gives us as the advertisers the responsibility Mm -hmm. to hook people but also sort the right people Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as we helped Outlet, a a brand for for products for babies, they were targeting pregnant women in their third trimester. And that Mm -hmm. was very expensive. And I was having my first baby at the time. And I was like, by the third trimester, our baby money is spent. Mm -hmm. But what we did is we created an ad that was an interaction between two parents and a back and forth about sleeping at night. Mm -hmm. That was the concern that my wife and I had as we were going Mm -hmm. into marriage. And what we found is we were getting 600 comments a day, husbands tagging wives, wives or grandmas tagging their kids, or, hey, you guys are going to have a baby soon. And Mm -hmm. they were, creative was helping us sort people. Mm -hmm. The 70-year-old woman that doesn't have any grandchildren isn't expecting them. It would deliver that in her feed. We'd skip her and we didn't have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And 
when people feel empowered to skip your ads, Mm -hmm. what happens is they don't hate your brand as much and you get, you know, the average retention rate on skippable ads is about 7% stay past 15 Mm -hmm. seconds. Our ads, we try to aim for 20 to 30%. Mm -hmm. And that means I only pay for that 20% of the audience that is interested. So they've qualified themselves through the creative. If the creative matches their desires and that 80% that I got for free, that's all free brand impressions. Mm -hmm. And so if you extrapolate backwards from the half billion views that we've had on pillow cube, we've had probably 2 billion of brand impressions for Mm -hmm. free out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, So we get some of that top of level branding. They're like, Oh, I've seen something about that. I'm going to go back and see something. So you get, you're getting all these free brand impressions in those Mm -hmm. first seconds. But then the really hard work of selling happened in the next two minutes. Hmm. Uh, and so we really like skippable ads. There's mm-hmm. brands that you know and I know, and I won't call them out by name, yeah. <laughs> but that we get all the time. And I'm like, I don't mm-hmm. want to see that thing one more time. Yeah. I don't care about what award they've won, mm-hmm. but I can't wait. That five second ad mm-hmm. is excruciating, mm-hmm. even if it's cleverly done because mm-hmm. I don't have power. But if you deliver me an ad that I don't realize I'm being advertised to at first, or I do realize, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. So if you look at our work on our clients' websites, and I'll send you to any of them, go look them on YouTube and half the comments are like, oh, I actually went back and searched the ad to watch it again. Mm. If we can the advertisement funny that people enjoy watching it, Mm -hmm. they'll give us three minutes of their time. Mm -hmm. And three minutes of their time is the same as six 30-second commercials but I can take them through their concerns. I can have a discussion Mm -hmm. back and forth with client, with potential customers and not just say my brand brand a lot in 30 seconds, Mm -hmm. tell Mm -hmm. one joke in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. You also talk about the earning your views. So you, you earn the, there's the first 15 seconds. And then, then after that you have from 15 to a minute, talk about the, the, like how you guys think about earning views. Yeah. So I actually look at it. There's the pre-scroll, the three seconds, five seconds, 15 inflection point, 15 seconds, 30 seconds and a minute are the key points. Mm-hmm. So we want a scroll stopping image. We, when we do our mm-hmm. research and our testing, we want to stop the scroll, but we also want to mm-hmm. stop the scroll for the right reason. Mm-hmm. I helped the film once and we had a great poster, but it was dark and scary, but this film was about this emotional forgiveness I'm like mm-hmm. hey this poster performed great among 18 to 24 four year old boys but our audience for this commercial is 34 to 55 year old women let's mm-hmm. say like it, it performing really poorly in the demo it's performing great but mm-hmm. not on the demographic that we want so we mm-hmm. we correlate the demographic data with the retention data mm-hmm. so i want to see ideally i want to see an ad level off in the first three seconds have a little bit of a plateau we've we've got your attention then I want to see it drop rapidly because I know whatever I'm selling, mm-hmm. 80% of, of America doesn't want it right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. So I want to drop it off, but I want to drop off the right people. So we mm-hmm. look at second by second metrics of whether mm-hmm. people are watching and we see, did they drop off because of joke and that joke fell flat? Mm-hmm. Or did they drop off because I mentioned what the product is? Mm-hmm. Not because I mentioned what the product is. That's great. I call that mm-hmm. a sort. Mm-hmm. And I'll mm-hmm. keep that, but I'll lose the joke that doesn't perform. Got it. One of our early and caller commercials we made, we had this really long montage that we thought was really funny of, well, we, first of all, we had this data that women were buying their men from their, this customer, 80% of their customers buying men's shirts were women buying them for their husbands because for whatever reason, or their significant mm-hmm. others. Yeah. Um, and it may be because it had a stain resistant element and they thought their, their significant others were slobs, but yeah. We leaned into that and said, like, okay, what makes a man sexy? It's that you don't have to take care of him. He can take care of himself. Yeah. Long montage of her taking care of him, doing his ironing. And I know this is stuck in, you know, the last generation, but it matched the data. Mm -hmm. But showing all the pains about taking care of shirts, doing Mm -hmm. laundry, dry cleaning, ironing. And people didn't want to watch the misery. And Mm. it was his worth of shooting, but we cut it out completely from a script. Hmm. We saw we were losing viewers too rapidly. Mm-hmm. They already knew what it was. So we just removed it from the video. And then once the video played, um, it, they no longer had that and the performance improved drastically mm-hmm. on that commercial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So 
So it sounds uh, like a lot of data, a lot of testing, a lot of like really digging in and making sure that you're not just putting out any sort of creative or any sort of um, work that you guys think will do well, but really looking at the the numbers. Yeah, but if I could also say that we do look at the numbers, but for us, we have a meeting with our performance team. We look at the numbers, but included in that meeting is the original writer, the original director, the editors, the account manager, mm -hmm. the producers, and we're discussing because the data shouldn't make the decision. Mm. They should give us clues, mm, but mm, as mm. advertisers, we gain experience to mm -hmm. have intuition, like, I think it's this, and mm. then let's test the hypothesis. Okay. So I like to have the data as feedback, but mm -hmm. I think that's one of the problems in the performance marketing world mm. is they're doing too much data and not mm. enough human interaction mm. with the ads. Why is that working? Can mm -hmm. we lean into that? more things instead of just like, oh, it has the color purple. Let's put purple in everything. Mm. Mm -hmm. Seeing people make decisions like that before. And mm -hmm. and sometimes you have two or three different theories and they might come from creative people or analytical mm -hmm. people, performance marketers. And um, I like to get those people all in the room together and have a discussion. I love that. And uh, that, that, you know, segues into the next question, which is what should the relationship be between the business side of the agency and the creative side of the house like what and it sounds like what you guys do is put everybody in a room and everybody talk to each other yeah so the very first thing we do with any client we don't pitch clients blind we get them in a room together we like to do a full day strategy retreat with them mm -hmm. and that strategy retreat is almost more like a therapy session mm -hmm. Very first thing we do is we sit down and everybody in that brand has two sentences to tell us what who their brand is. Hmm. Show back like this is who you guys think your brand is. And sometimes it will be very esoteric. Sometimes it will be very much we make a shovel that digs in dirt and they haven't thought about, but why is that different? How does that make your life hmm. better? Mm -hmm. It helps us know where they are and that back and forth between our team and theirs hmm. kind of feel that energy. And I think we are we're we're teaching and developing a strategy but we're also teaching creative collaboration in that mm -hmm. I think those teams have to like each other, even though their brains are very different. Mm -hmm. the creative and our performance teams have to get along. Mm -hmm. Handshake is as important as the results because mm -hmm. they can have, it's important to have theories and then creative people like, oh, that's an interesting theory. What if we tried this with it? And yeah. I believe everybody will be, can be creative in their own sphere. Mm -hmm. There is power when they get together and work on things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, that there's, you guys are very intentional in terms of how you do it. There's a very uh, process-driven way of, of bringing on every client. It sounds like, you know, when you guys bring on a client, then you have an idea. It's like, you don't just send it out to your team. There's like so many people who are contributing and then like you look at all of So it's really like a sifting process that makes it so you're not, siloed in terms of your ideas of what you're considering but really making sure that you're you're really being open and looking at multiple multiple ways of going forward with the idea yeah so we have uh, i'm sorry i hope i sound didn't beep on you there we have multiple ways of approaching a script and so we don't pitch a concept we have multiple comedians writers copywriters strategists write scripts mm -hmm. based on that strategy day and then we perform them. But sometimes an editor will have an idea and like, hey, let, can I pitch? Can I write it? I'm like, sure, write it up. Hmm. And sometimes an idea that's not fully fleshed gets pitched and we perform it in the room. Hmm. It's it picked, but then we all embrace that. Mm -hmm. We have a process of everybody takes their own ideas and, and develops a full script. Mm -hmm. And then we start acting more like a TV show and have a writer's room of four to five writers sitting around, working on jokes, adding, plussing, up mm -hmm. a, a script and, and adding more to it and um, debating one joke versus another. But it gets us all back then. We've just pitched our own ideas, but now we're going to love this other person's script again. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some of our own jokes from our spot or somebody else's spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's, you know, a lot of your work, it's just genius. Um, what would you say is the most important thing in building trust with a client? That's hard. I'm not always great at it. I I, I wish I was better. Um, I want to I want to please clients. I mm -hmm. really do. I want them to be happy. And there's always a conflict between what you want them to be happy and when you have to tell them a hard truth. 
Mm. I think we build trust with how we handle hard conversations. Mm -hmm. It's easy when everything's going great Mm. and having hard conversations. Like, I really disagree with you here. Mm. Learning how to have that conversation uh, with care, with love, and not absolutely like you can say like I think you're wrong and you're stupid to do it that way, or you can say my experience has shown me this and this and this. We can try this. You've mm-hmm. paid me for my opinion, and I'm going to offer this. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's some possible middle ground. But I, you know, with creative decisions, I don't like compromise because I think that mm. that takes you back to that room with ten people that are okay with an idea. Mm-hmm. I would rather like yeah. here's my idea. This is what I believe. And if you believe different, that's fine. Let's go at your idea and mm-hmm. I will execute it with full fervor. Mm-hmm. And make it as great as that can be. And yeah. I'm wrong sometimes too. Mm-hmm. And so I think admitting you're wrong helps um, as long as it's not too often. <laughs> uh, and loving other people. Build, one of the things that we do in our strategy retreat is there's a couple of brainstorming activities and sometimes great ideas will come from the clients. Mm-hmm. We're not above letting them lead that mm-hmm. chart and helping them because it's about that creative process. Mm-hmm. Helping them like, ah, yes, doing things as a team and seeing that that line blur between the two teams helps build trust. And if they pitch a concept that you would turn into a great script, they have some emotional ownership and that builds trust too. And, mm-hmm. and seeing when their joke makes it into the script or their concept and they see themselves reflected mm-hmm. and they feel like, this is our, this is our commercial. Mm-hmm. So that, that thread wallet commercial that you mm-hmm. saw that you said, I don't know if that wallet's right for me. They were, they're a very cool brand that has a lot of surfers and skaters in their stuff. And mm-hmm. they were worried we might be a little silly. Um, but ultimately we told a story that felt like the founders and they loved it because mm-hmm on them with it and it was the right humor for them and as we went through the pixel apocalypse you know the last two yeah. years and lose pixel data they found as long as they played that at the top of the funnel mm. they may not be able to completely attribute as well but all their pieces performed better because mm-hmm. who they were mm-hmm. and um, i think a lot can come out of understanding somebody a lot of trust is built by taking the time to have empathy and understand where people are coming from and, mm-hmm. and back to them. I, I, I love that. Um, and it was like such a cute video. It's like their, their love story um, and then tying it back to the product. And I want to touch on something that you said, talking about the pixel. So you, you said you target people, not pixels. And you also talk about how the, you know, with the pixel apocalypse, um, for you Sorry, guys, because... I like to make up words so. <laughs> because of the the sort of content, creative content that you guys are creating. It didn't affect you as much as it create, you know, affected maybe other companies. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I was at an advertising conference and, and speaking to a bunch of ad buyers that I've worked with in the past. They're like, "Oh, how'd you make it through last year?" And hardest year we've had in twenty years. And we definitely had some bumps in the road. But I was like, yeah. that was when I first realized, like, oh, we're not struggling as much as a lot of these people are. And I think it's going back to that, that key strategic or tactic decision we made, we make to start everything at the top of the funnel mm-hmm. the pixel or let the creative find its people. I love that. You know it to everybody yeah. and the creative will find its people. The, the so pixel good. still has some data. The Facebook attribution is still better than any other platforms attribution cycle. It's much less than it was. And I can't just, put stuff in it will find people that want to buy shirts, but I can tell them a story about the best shirt in the world Mm -hmm. and people that feel that pain are going to share it with other people. Mm -hmm. And if it's, and if it makes financial sense and if it drives enough revenue, it's easy to double that spend and then double that spend and then grow and grow and grow into Mm -hmm. a campaign. So I, that's why I think we, you know, the pixel is still helpful and it's still important, but we feel like we try we always ask ourselves, how can we talk to the most amount of people about this story? So mm-hmm. the product that you and I met over was a menstrual product. Yeah. So it was a fantastic company. Yeah. We actually had them test when we ran. We have a single father in the commercial. And mm-hmm. We said, we want to show this to men as well. Because mm-hmm. we found our, the men and we had women and men in the in the writing team. And I wanted them both in the team. Mm-hmm. 
And we were so, the men were so fascinated about the things that we were learning, you know, and I, I had a zoology minor and studied biology also. And I knew a lot of things, <laughs> yeah. but learned so much was fascinated by it. And yeah. Like, how do we make this? How do we talk about a topic, topic so it doesn't feel taboo? Yeah. So it feels interesting. And I'm yeah. learning because people mm-hmm. also like to learn. Mm-hmm. And our first test, obviously, we're going to target women on Facebook. Yeah. But our first test, we're like, we want to show this broad and see who we pick up in the male audience. Yeah. And we pick up some people. And if you are, you're, you're surprised at who you can find mm-hmm. that you hadn't considered. So mm-hmm. with the other brand, Al, that I told you about, we found grandparents. Mm-hmm. We increased the grandparent purchasing this for mm-hmm. kids. With our with Pillow Cube, we can target people with neck pain, but we find spouses will, or loved ones, significant others, will often splurge on a pillow where that sleeper won't, especially when it comes to snoring. <laughs> like, people don't feel like, I don't feel like I can splurge on that. Yeah. I, a cheap pillow is just fine for me. Yeah. But significant others want, I want my wife to sleep really well at night. Mm. Mm. she's her best self and Mm. so sometimes talking to the people around the purchasers Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, with manly bands we knew that men women were buying the wedding rings for men yeah uh, being underserved so we had to talk to women in a very manly way yeah up to and they were doing the same thing they were targeting people that facebook knew were engaged Mm -hmm. we said everybody in america knows somebody who's getting married let's tell a story that they'll think is funny yeah they'll tag them and find them and it was great the and then the fact like you said it's the 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 bride to be that says hey honey you don't have to have a a sucky band like here's an option for you and she's the one that introduces this opportunity for them yeah we found that we had to talk to him in multiple ways but the guy feels like she's making a hundred thousand dollars worth of decisions and he gets a three hundred dollar ring and yeah <laughs> By playing up the comedy of that tension, yeah. that they can both watch it together and they can tag each other in it and it could create conversations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and Manly Bands has really doubled down on video content. Now they have their own mm-hmm. studio. And they their wow. Own. Yeah. That's super exciting. And, and I love that. Let creative find its people, find the right people. So I am conscious of time. Um, last question would be if... You know, the, again, the the focus of this show is for people who are in the ad space and the marketing space. How do we think creatively? So, if you could leave our viewers or listeners with just one thought for them to to be better, to do better by their clients, or just to be better, you know, professionals. What's what's the one takeaway you would want them to to ponder or to to really think about or to bring into their agencies um, to the work with their clients? What's what's the one takeaway that you'd really like to leave them with this will sound like fuzzy and i think my secret is to love people and Mm. love the stuff stuff Mm. isn't important so it becomes about people but you can't i see advertisers that have disdain for like the public and like well Mm. the masses are done whatever and definitely groups of people can be unwise into making decisions but i think not having you know, knowing knowing your customers and and developing an empathy for what they're going through and developing a love for them. There there needs to be more love in mm. in the advertising space mm. uh, for the people we serve, for the people we work mm. with, mm. and that allows you to be allows your team to be creatively generous. I love it that. Allows you to speak to people in a way that they don't feel condescended to mm-hmm. and they don't feel like you're tra- you're trying to be too cool for them mm-hmm. everybody wants to be cool but it can turn people off some of the mm-hmm. biggest brands in the world aren't hip brands or helpful brands mm-hmm. and i think being service minded in in a, our advertising approach um can open up new adver- avenues that other people aren't using Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's beautiful. Uh, I, I don't think any of us can argue with more love in the advertising space. Uh, and if people wanted to learn more about Creatively or find you, Damien, what's what's the best way that they can connect with you guys or see you about your work or hire you or learn from you? Yeah. So we don't have a huge sales force. We have a Tom and he's our business development kind of coach and bring people in. You can set up an appointment with him at creatively.com. 
Uh, if you just want to chat with me, I love talking with people. You can find me on LinkedIn or on Facebook. I'm the only Damien Dayton in the world. So that makes it easy to find me. Um, as long as you don't try to sell me like your lead generation tool, I get a lot of those on LinkedIn these days. But if you want to talk to me about creativity or advice on growing your business, especially if you're an innovator, you're building a disruptive product, or you just have a great product and you want to grow faster, yeah. um, always happy to talk. Awesome. So. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to all our listeners, our viewers. Super excited for our upcoming episodes. Again, bringing you some of the more less talked about, innovative, interesting, cutting edge things that are happening in branding and marketing in the advertising world. So, so excited that you could join us and I will catch you next time. Thank you so much, Luz. Thank you.